Matthew Arnold was a 19th century English poet. And a few years ago, I came upon something that he had written in an email that I received. It was a daily email that came to me from a common meditation for all souls, which is now operating under the name of First Light Meditation. And it read, but often in the world's most crowded streets, often in the din of strife, there rises an unspeakable desire after the knowledge of our buried life, a thirst to spend our fire in and restless force in tracking out our true original course, a longing to inquire into the mystery of this heart which beats so wildly so deep within us, to know whence our lives come and where they go. His words struck me as setting forth in very poetic form some of those toughest questions that we find ourselves asking from time to time. You know, like, what is this life all about? What is the, the meaning of life, of my life? Where did we come from and where do we go when we leave this life? And how, where, and when am I going to find all the answers to these questions? I do think that every once in a while, something will get our attention. It could be a significant life event, or it could just be our natural curiosity. It's something that just gives us that inner nudge of knowing that there must be something more than our day-to-day -day routines and, and responsibilities. That there must be something more to this life than our calendars and our task lists. And not that any of those things are not significant, not that they're not important, but rather it's just that something else feels missing. Maybe something that would provide a, a deeper meaning to all that, that we do or all that we are, are being in this life. Something that would make us feel a bit more complete in a way. And I found for myself, I, I do believe that this kind of questioning is that which invariably invites us to go below the surface level of life and do some of that inner aspiration. And, and doing that can sometimes be a bit challenging. Sometimes we're, we're anxious about what we might find. Sometimes we don't recognize or like what we do find. And very often we come away from that first process, that first step into the process, with more questions than we had when we first started out. This kind of journey inward is one that Unity Minister Robert Robert wrote about nearly 20 years ago now, back in 2002. And Robert is a, a long time, probably 45 years at least as a Unity Minister. Uh, he's a long time member of the faculty. Missouri, I was blessed to be in many of his classes when I was at seminary. And, and this, this, this journey inward is what Robert calls quest. And what we are seeking, he says, is wholeness. And thus, one of his books that he has written is titled The Quest for Wholeness Healing Ourselves, Healing Our World. And this book will be our main reference for, for today as we focus on spiritual healing. And then we'll pull it back off the shelf next month when we spend a little time with the idea of wholeness itself. But today we're going to begin with some foundational work relative to the process of spiritual healing. And maybe the, the best thing to, to lay down first onto that foundation is, is a way that we could define what spiritual healing is. And so Robert offered this definition in his book. He says, spiritual healing is making visible the wholeness that lies invisible within each of us. Okay, spiritual healing is making visible the wholeness which lies invisible within each of us. To me, that statement 
basically expresses much of what if we include in what we refer to in unity as our first two basic spiritual principles. You know, first, there is one presence and power in the universe, many of us calling it God, and, and it is the foundation of all existence, right? And that, that is an absolute unchanging reality with a capital R, an absolute reality. And then the second principle that you know we, we are a carrier of this presence. We are expressions of that one reality. So this foundation tells us that since we are intrinsically spiritual beings, we cannot be sick or poor or unhappy because we are perfectly whole. However, as human beings, of course, we can be sick or poor or unhappy and so forth. I mean, millions of us have proven that to be true since the start of time. There's a real paradox at play in, in, in this life, and that is that our potential being so great, as well as our suffering, and that can cause us to lose sight sometimes of our divinity. It gets lost, perhaps, or just covered over by our humanity. It happens when, as Robert puts it, we turn reality upside down. He writes, humanity is the vehicle through which we are expressing our spiritual, our, our true nature. We are spiritual beings having human experiences. But most humans believe the opposite to be true. Most people believe that they are innately human and then strive to become more spiritual. Thus, we have turned reality upside down. But a Chinese proverb says the snow goose need to do nothing to make itself white. We need to do nothing to become more spiritual. So this is our foundation for spiritual healing, unknowing of our inherent wholeness as spiritual beings. And then the next building blocks we begin to place upon that foundation of spiritual healing are the ones that we create as we move through this adventure we call life, but we live this life in tandem with that inner knowing. So one of the first things that, that Robert refers to is that of placing the focus for spiritual healing on ourselves, on ourselves. And to do that, we have to recognize the need for spiritual healing within ourselves. And the comment arises out of the fact that healing goes far beyond what we associate with physical illnesses. You know, while physical challenges, yes, they are ours to experience. They are ours uniquely to move through. But there are other conditions of discomfort and suffering, whether it be mental or emotional, spiritual, that can involve other people. For example, that you know, I've spent a lot of time many years ago pointing my finger of blame at my ex-husband. He was causing all of the upset and suffering I was experiencing as we moved through our time of, of separation and divorce. Or maybe you've looked at others as the cause of your pain and suffering. Maybe when, when you didn't get the promotion, we thank you. You weren't chosen for the team, or you lost out on a scholarship. You didn't close the big sale. Robert believes that when we blame other people, when we blame circumstances for our suffering, that's when we're not seeing the need for our own spiritual healing. <laughs> and so our healing begins with this recognition of our need for it. As I envision a building, a literal building, literal foundation, you know, at its base, it makes sense to me in the context we're talking about today that the self-recognition would be the very first thing placed upon that foundation, touching it, being the closest to it. Because this recognition for our need for spiritual healing within ourselves is a reminder of who we really are. It's a reminder of our foundation. It's a reminder of our spiritual nature. And that first step back into that true self of ourselves is a step that invites spirit 
into the process of healing with us that we are about to embark upon. Then we turn to human beings for assistance as we're guided by spirit. You see, when I say anybody says, you know, we turn to spirit, that does not equate to avoiding human, human assistance. Right? It also doesn't mean that we don't immediately change situations that might be harmful or, or, or dangerous in some way. It says we just go to God first. And then we remember something that I've heard said many times, I've offered it myself many times, and that is then God works through us. God does not take the steps for us. Spirit does not do the work for us. It works through us. So in other words, we part of the spirit and it becomes our guide. It is the unchanging source of wisdom and strength and discernment and understanding for whatever our next steps might be and, and what they are that we are to take. And so recognizing the need for healing is one thing, and it's a whole other thing to address it. And the willingness that we're talking about, I think it has to almost, if not 100%, be unconditional in nature when we, when we think about it, when we speak about it. Because if we say something like, oh, I'm, I'm willing to do this as long as it doesn't involve X, well, then that's not unconditional. We're putting conditions on our willingness. We're also putting limitations on our ability for healing. And to be honest, I think that it's in all those Xs where more often than not, it's we find the most important wisdom and strength and guidance and understanding and everything else that we seek. So being willing to bring forth that spiritual healing means that we are prepared to do so, even if the process isn't fun, even if the process isn't all that easy sometimes. It means that we care enough about all of those questions that got our attention, all of the desires that are in our hearts to feel whole and more complete in some way. We care so much about that that we're willing to accept and move through all of the emotions, all of the feelings that are going to come up in this process. It means that we will traverse the bumps that will show up in the road, and if we fall down and trip over them, then when we're down, we're going to spend that time with the reasons we started out in the first place. And then, when we remember once again, we'll get up, and our feet will be planted firmly again on that foundation, and we'll continue forward with spirit as our ever-present guide. Two other aspects of spiritual healing that, that Robert writes about in his book are what I refer to as reframing suffering and then creating a vision for healing. So what would reframing suffering look like? Well, maybe let's first consider how we might view it before reframing it. You know, we might see suffering or believe it to, to be a form of punishment. Or maybe we see suffering as something that is proof positive that we are really sinful, that we are so flawed in some way. <clears throat> or maybe we go to the point of Believing that punishment is something that we earned, we deserve the punishment, the suffering. So let's try to let go of all of that and look at a healthier way to be with suffering, to be with the discomfort when it comes. And so staying with Robert for just a moment, let me share with you that he's very Buddhist in his spirituality, in his practices. He has studied and incorporated the Buddhist philosophies into his life now. For many years, he has beautifully integrated his philosophy into his work as a unity minister and teacher and author. And one word that I have often come across when I have read articles on Buddhism is the word illusion. And that's a tricky word for me when I hear it or read it being used relative to this life, relative to the experiences in this life. And I found that there are different schools of thought within Buddhism itself around what illusion means relative to life. And this is one that I found that I can get on board with. It said the perceived reality is considered illusory 
not in the sense that reality is a fantasy or unreal, but that our perceptions and preconditions mislead us to believe that we are separate from the elements that we are made of. Now, what are those words? And compare them to how Robert writes about evolution relative to suffering. He says, suffering is a symptom. Believing an illusion to be a reality is the cause. Realizing the truth with capital T is the remedy. Our primary illusion is a deep-seated perception of separation from our source, our true nature, which we call God. So whether you come, come to this through Buddhist philosophy or unity teachings or one author's opinion, we're all taken back to source, to that unchanging, unshifting foundation that supports our healing processes. Spirit, its presence in us, whole and perfect in every way. Now that might sound nice. <laughs> I think the word sound nice, you know. But I know that for myself, there are times when they are just a collection of words banging around in my head. I know them. I can speak them. I can teach them. I believe them to be true. But up here, it doesn't always equate to feeling them in my heart. It doesn't always equate to expressing them in my life. Especially when I'm in times of suffering or discomfort or pain. And that's where creating a vision for healing can come into play. So think about the healing that your heart desires, whether it's something that's present in your life right now, or you can think about something maybe from your past. Many times, when a desire like that gets our attention, what do we do? What do we do? We talk about it. We might pray about it. We might create a vision board, reflecting what it could look like when that desire manifests, right? But we can do the same thing with how we do suffering and our desire to move through it. And just putting the word God or a picture that is reflective of what that energy looks like to us on a piece of paper, most of the time isn't going to be enough. If you've been in unity for about five days or more, you probably know what I'm going to say next. What else are we asked to do? You know, we're asked to take action. We're asked to put feet to our prayers or the words in our journal or the beliefs in our hearts. We're supposed to take action. And we can only do that if we don't avoid suffering. If we don't do a spiritual bypass of it, saying, well, I just add one more spiritual practice to my daily activities and all this other bad stuff is just going to go away. No, that's not what we do when we, we get down in the dirt with it. Jesse Harriet is a college professor. He's a writer. He's a lecturer on spiritual psychology and Christian mysticism. And he wrote an article that was posted on the resources page of Unity Worldwide's um, website. And in it, he offered a few things that I feel could be very helpful to us in creating a vision for how we would like our spiritual healing to unfold, and thus making it easier for us to meet any suffering at the depth that it is within us. And so again, let's remember that we've reframed our thoughts, our, our perceptions, our preconditions that would tell us that suffering means that we're bad or deserving of it, and so forth. We've let all that go. So now we have this blank slate in front of us to, to put on it a vision of a new perspective, one that can lead us more easily and more quickly to that healing that we seek. And it would be a perspective that when you put it up there on that vision board in your mind, it would see the pain and discomfort and suffering. We would see those things often acting as life's greatest transformational agents. Greatest transformational agents. It would be a vision that would see that all of that is a way of just nudging us towards a greater level of unfoldment, a greater level of expression, and a greater level of being in this world. 
it would be one that would point out very, very clearly that regardless of all of the spiritual practices that we incorporate into our lives, pain and discomfort are necessary agents of our journey. That when we resist life and what it brings, we actually increase and prolong the discomfort in life. And we will see, perhaps most clearly of all, that the very same presence of spirit in us that high-fives us on the good days and all the celebrations is the very same one that will lead us through the more difficult and not so great experiences too. What this new and revised perspective does is help us to use our spiritual practices not to avoid circumstances that are difficult, to process them. Not to bottle up our emotions or feel guilty for having them or allow them to take control, but to use them to bring forth what are very often some of the greatest healings that we can ever experience. And then when we're done to release those emotions, move back more completely to our center, to our true foundation, and see that there is never a time that we are not okay as where we are, always being loved and protected and guided. Spiritual healing is making visible the wholeness that lies invisible within each of us. There are two tenets that underlie that statement from Robert's book. The first is that spiritual healing manifests itself in as many ways as there are individuals manifesting it. And second, while it is often multidimensional in nature, spiritual healing does not have to be. To the first point, the main takeaway is to not get attached to that one so specific, detailed way for your healing to manifest. Remember that it's not, it's not a function of a treatment method, whether that's conventional or alternative. It is a function of the view that we hold and how we incorporate that into our healing processes. See, for example, if we have a headache, we take an aspirin, and it goes away, and that's what we wanted. We say we're healed. And that might be the case, but probably many times not necessarily so. See, because if we took more time to just be with maybe the truest healing of that headache, it would require us to, to work more with some medical professionals to, to take a closer look at some physical health issues that that headache might be guiding us towards. Or maybe that headache was just the first nudge to the modification of some eating habits or an examination of our, of our values or our beliefs. Or maybe the headache is the first twinge towards healing an emotional wound that is trying to get our attention because it is what needs the healing most. Remember that spiritual healing is about bringing our inherent wholeness into expression. And that means recognizing the interrelatedness of all aspects of our being, not just what shows up at the surface all the time. And then to the second point, what I need to do is put an asterisk on something I said earlier. When I said that we need to put our feet to our prayers and our, our words and so forth, and yes, that is important. I'm not taking it away. But there are some times when that's not really possible. Sometimes it's not physically possible to move into to action beyond a prayer or beyond a poem that you've written in your journal. But that's no reason to forego your spiritual healing. Because that healing, it can take place with only the foundation that we set when we first began. Sometimes that's the only thing that needs to be in place. Just that one focused, intentional thought placed on that reality of God being that one presence and one power in this life. And not only is that a necessary 
condition for spiritual healing. It can also be a sufficient condition for our healing. Healing at any level can occur through just a deep realization of spiritual truth. Sometimes that is the only action that needs to be taken. And I think that says an awful lot about this thing we talk so much about and we call the one presence and, and one power in our world. But it is one that guided our unit movement into its being, a movement that was built upon a foundation of faith and spirit, faith and spirit, and upon the power of prayer. So I thought it would be appropriate to close our lesson today with the words that were held in silent thought every night at 10 o'clock Central Time, starting in 1889, when our co-founder, Moral Fulmore, announced the opening of the Society for Silent Health which we all know today to be Simon Unity on 24-7 prayer ministry that reaches out and touches every, every corner of this, this world. And so I offer the words that the initial group of what we would today call prayer associates held in silent thought every night. God is all goodness and everywhere present. He is the loving Father, and I am his child, and have all his attributes of life, love, truth, and intelligence. In him is all health, strength, wisdom, and harmony, and as his child, these become mine by the recognition of the truth that God is mine. Sometimes our deepest levels of healing, our spiritual healing, it can be as simple as that. Just one moment of recognition of the truth that God is all. God bless you.